Mr. McCoy back with part 16, the conclusion of The Devil's Arithmetic. The guard dismissed her pleas with a wave of his hand and all four of them held their breath, waiting. I was told that we need three more Jews to make up a full load. Commandant Brewer believes in efficiency and our units do not work well with short loads. So I was sent to find three of the Commandant's pets who were not working. He told me personally to make up the load. We were working, Shifra begged, her words tumbling out in a rush. And we are healthy. We are healthy hard workers. You never take healthy hard workers. It is one of the rules. Never. The guard smiled again. Since Commandant Brewer makes the rules, I guess he can change the rules. But why are you worrying so, Liebchen? I only need three. Perhaps I won't take you. He looked over the girl slowly, the smile still on his face. I'll take you. You are the least healthy. He pointed to Esther, who almost fell forward in front of him as if someone had suddenly kicked her in the back of the knees. Shifri drew in a great loud breath and closed her eyes. And you, he said, playfully putting his finger on Shifra's nose, almost as if he were flirting with her, because you protest too much after all. And, and, Hannah let out her breath as slowly as she dared. She did nothing to call attention to herself, to stay alive one more day, one more hour, one more minute. That was all any of them thought of. It was all they could hope for. Rivka was right. What she had was not a memory but a dream. And you, with the babushka, like a little old lady, I'll take you too. He pointed to Rivka, winked at Hannah, then turned and marched smartly toward the gate, confident that the chosen girls would follow. Rivka gave Hannah a quick hug. Who will remember for you now? She whispered. Hannah said nothing. The memories of Lublin and the shuttle and the camp itself suddenly seemed like the dreams. She lived, had lived, would live in the future. She or someone with whom she shared memories, but Rivka had only now. Without thinking through the why of it, Hannah snatched the kerchief off Rivka's head. Run, she whispered. Run to the midden. Run to the barracks. Run to the kitchen. The guard is new. He won't know the difference. One Jew is the same as another to him. Run for your life, Rivka. Run for your future. Run. 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 And remember, what do you predict is going to happen now? Share with your fellow listener. As she spoke, she shoved Rivka away, untied the knot of the kerchief with trembling fingers, and retied it about her own head. Then, as Rivka's footsteps faded behind her, she walked purposefully, head high, after Shifri and Esther. When she caught up with them, she put her arms around their waists as if they were three schoolgirls just walking in the yard. Let me tell you a story, she said quietly, ignoring the fact that they were both weeping, Shifra loudly and Esther with short little gasps. A story I know you will love. The strength in their voice quieted them, and they began to listen, even as they walked. It is about a girl, an ordinary sort of girl named Hannah Stern, who lives in New Rochelle. Not old Rochelle, there is no old Rochelle, you see, just new Rochelle. It is in an America where pictures come across a cable, moving pictures right into your living room, and she stopped as the dark door of the Lilith's cave opened before them, and where one day I bet a Jewish girl will be president if she wants to be. Are you ready now? Ready or not, here we come. And all three of them took deep, ragged breaths and walked in through the door into endless night. When the dark finally resolved itself, Hannah found she was looking across an empty hall at a green door marked four in. Four for the four members of my family, Hannah thought, and in for New Rochelle. She couldn't see Shifre or Esther anymore. They had slipped away without a farewell. She almost called out their names, thought better of it, and turned to look behind her. There was a large table set with a white cloth. The table was piled high with food, matzah, roast beef, hard-boiled eggs, goblets of deep red wine. Seven adults and a little blonde boy were sitting there, their mouths open expectantly. Well, Hannah, said the old man at the head of the table, is he coming? 
Hannah turned back and looked down the long, dark hall. It was still empty. There's no one there, she whispered. No one. Then come back to the table and shut the door, called out the other old man. There's a draft. You know your Aunt Rose gets these chills. Sam, don't hurry the child so. She's doing her part. The woman who spoke had a plain face lit up by a special smile. Come, sweetheart. Sit by Aunt Eva. She patted an empty chair next to her, then reached over and picked up her glass of wine. You look so white, Hannah Lay, like death. How can we fix that? She raised her glass, looked at Hannah, le claim, to life. She took a sip. Hannah slipped into the chair, knowing it was the one the family reserved for the prophet Elijah, who slipped through the centuries like a fish through water. She watched all the grown-ups raise their glasses. Le claim. Aunt Eva turned toward her, smiling. Her sweater was pushed back beyond her wrist. She raised the glass again. Hannah noticed the number on her arm. J18202. Hannah Lay, you're staring, whispered Aunt Eva as the talk began around the table. Uncle Sam arguing about the price of new cars, Grandpa Will complaining about the latest government scandal, her mother asking Aunt Rose about a book. Staring. She repeated the word without understanding. Yes, at my arm, at the number. Does it frighten you still? You've never let me explain it to you, and your mother hates me to talk of it. Still, you want me to... Hannah touched the number on her aunt's arm with surprising gentleness, whispering, No, no, please, let me explain it to you. For a moment, she was silent. Then she said, J is for Jew. And one is because you were alone, alone of the eight who had been in your family, though two was actually the number of them alive. Your brother was Commando, one of the Jews forced to tend the ovens to handle the dead, so he thought he was a zero. She looked up at Eva, who was staring at her. Oh, your brother, Grandpa Will, that must have been him carrying Faggy. So that's why... Eyes for a moment as if thinking or remembering. Then she whispered back, His name was Wolf. Wolf, and the irony of it is that he was as gentle as a lamb. He changed his name when he came to America. We all changed our names to forget. Remembering was too painful, but to forget was impossible. Her coffee brown eyes opened again. Go on, child. Anna took her hand from her aunt's arm and dropped it into the safety of her own lap. She couldn't look at her aunt any more, that familiar, unfamiliar, plain, beautiful face. You said, she whispered, uh, you said that when things were over, you would be two again forever. J18202. They sat for a long moment in silence while the talk and laughter at the table dipped and soared about them like swallows. At last, Hannah looked up. Her aunt was staring at her, as if really seeing her for the first time. Aunt Eva, Hannah began. At last, Hannah looked up. Her aunt was staring at her, as if really seeing her for the first time. Aunt Eva, Hannah began, and Eva's hand touched her on the lips firmly, as if to stop her mouth from saying what had to be said. In my village, in the camp, in the past, Eva said, I was called Rivka. Hannah nodded and took her aunt's fingers from her lips. She said, in a voice much louder than she had intended, so loud that the entire table hushed in its sound, I remember. Oh, I remember. So, what's going on right now? What happened to Hannah? Share what you're thinking right now. Aunt Eva told Hannah the end of the story much later when the two of them were alone because no one else would ever have believed them. She said that of all the villagers young Chaya had come to the camp with that spring, only two were alive at the end of the war. Yitchik, who had indeed escaped, had lived in the forest with the partisans fighting the Germans. And Gittel, when the camp had been liberated in 1945, Gittel weighed only 73 pounds because she had insisted on sharing her rations with the children. But she was alive. The Blavoka and all the villagers from Vyas were dead. But among the living, besides Gittel, Yitchik, and Rivka, were Leia and her baby, a solemn three-year-old.
Gittel and Yitchik had immigrated to Israel where they lived close friends until well into their 70s. Neither of them ever married. Yitchik became a po politician, a member of the Israeli Senate, the Knesset. Gittel, known throughout the country as Tante Gittel and Gittel the Bear, organized a rescue mission dedicated to salvaging the lives of young survivors and locating the remnants of their families. It later became an adoption agency, the finest in the Mideast. She called it after her young niece, who had died a hero in the camps, Chaya, life. So that really truly marks the end. Share your opinion about the devil's arithmetic. Next comes the section entitled, What is True About This Book? It is written, of course, by the author, Jane Yolen, from her perspective, here it comes. Although the Stearns Cedar is not strictly a traditional one, it is a mirror of the cedars my family used to hold. My Uncle Lewis was the one who always said, and how do I know because I was there? while hiding the afikoman in plain sight under his chair for the youngest to find and hide again. The word cedar literally means order, but my family's religious life was not an orderly one. Like many American Jews, it was one of rough and tumble choices and lots of love. We were Jews because we were born Jewish, not because of following strict rules. When I had to memorize Hebrew and history for my confirmation, I continually complained how tired I was of remembering. However, there was an orderly progress to a cedar that a perusal of its guidebook, the Haggadah, will show to the curious reader. All the facts about the horrible routinization of evil in the camps is true. The nightmare journeys in cattle cars, the shaving of heads, the tattooing of numbers, the separation of families, the malnutrition, the musclemen and the commodos, lack of proper clothing, the choosing of the victims for incineration, even the midden pile comes from the camp experiences of one of my friends. Only the characters are made up, Chaya, Gittel, Shmuel, Rivka, and the rest, though they are made up of the bits and pieces of true stories that got brought out by the pitiful handful of survivors. The unnamed camp I have written about did not exist. Rather, it is an amalgam of the camps that did. Auschwitz, with its ironic sign, was the worst of them, where in two and a half years, two million Jews and two million Soviet prisoners of war, Polish prisoners, Polish political, Polish political prisoners, gypsies, and European non-Jews were gassed. The toll is endless and anonymous. Whole families, whole villages, whole countrysides disappeared. At the time of the Holocaust, it seemed impossible to imagine for the scale of slaughter was difficult to grasp. Today, a lifetime later, we can echo Winston Churchill who wrote, There is no doubt that this is probably the greatest and most horrible single crime ever committed in the whole history of the world, and yet it is still impossible, unimaginable, difficult to grasp. Even with the facts in front of us, the numbers, the indelible photographs, the autobiographies, the risks still bearing the long numbers, there are people in the world who deny such things actually happen. After all, how can we believe that human beings like ourselves, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, could visit upon their fellow humans such programmed misery, such a routine of torture, all couched in the language of manufacture, so many units delivered, operating at full capacity. These were not camps, even though they were called so. These were factories designed for the effective murder of human beings. There is no way that fiction can come close to touching how truly inhuman, alien, even sadistic and satanic was the efficient machinery of death at the camps, nor how heroism had to be counted, not in resistance, which was worse than useless because it meant involving the deaths of even more innocents. Not to act, Emanuel Ringelbaum, a Jewish historian of the Holocaust, has written, not to lift a hand against the Germans had become the quiet, passive heroism of the common Jew. That heroism, to resist being dehumanized, to simply outlive one's tormentors, to practice the quiet, everyday caring for one's equally tormented neighbors, to witness, to remember, these were the only victories of the camps. 
Fiction cannot recite the numbing numbers, but it can be that witness, that memory. A storyteller can attempt to tell the human tale, can make a galaxy out of the chaos, can point to the fact that some people survived even as most people died, and can remind us that the swallows still sing around the smokestacks. This officially marks the end of The Devil's Arithmetic. Coming soon is our next adventure. Be sure you're in the audience, tuned in, and ready to go.